Good evening and welcome to our special on the 2022 Shaw Prize. The measurement of the distance and motions of the stars is one of the most central fields in astronomy. We've been charting the stars from Earth with optical telescopes for centuries. But two revolutionary space missions changed everything. The Hipparchos and Gaia Space Telescopes gave scientists a massive trove of observational data unprecedented in size and accuracy. Michael Perriman and Leonard Lindegren share the 2022 Shaw Prize in Astronomy for their key contributions to these two missions. the Lund Observatory, Sweden. Professor Leonard Lindegren has a nostalgic moment with one of the telescopes on campus. The astronomer has observed the stars for over 40 years, starting at Lund University, where he earned his PhD in 1980. When I started to study astronomy, it was still in the old observatory in Lund. And there in a room next to the uh, lecture hall was an old brass instrument that fascinated me from the very first time I saw it. Uh, when it was explained to me how it worked, I realized that uh, although it had not been used for a very long time, it was very ingeniously designed to do very accurate measurements and every detail of the instrument was carefully thought out to maximize the accuracy that you can reach. And that made me very fascinated of this uh, particular field of astronomy. The field of astrometry provides the fundamental data that supports nearly every aspect of astronomy and astrophysics. The stars have been sending out their spheres since the Big Bang. In the second century BC, Greek astronomer Hippocus mapped a thousand stars and charted them in the sky. Astrometry tells us a lot about the position, velocity, and how far away the stars are from Earth. Its scientists strive for great accuracy. I had studied uh, mathematics and physics at the university here in Lund, uh, and uh, there was the possibility to take an optional course in astronomy as part of the physics education. And I chose to do that, and uh, it really got me interested. I had been interested in astronomy for, for many years as an amateur, but I had not really thought until then that it might be possible to make a career of it. The Hipparco Space Telescope launched in 1989 by the European Space Agency. Astrometry had hit a brick wall in terms of accuracy, with telescopes stuck here on Earth under the precious but distorting effects of our atmosphere. Hipparchos was to orbit the Earth to take measurements of the stars in the Milky Way using a time-tested method, parallax. We have the Sun, we have the Earth orbit around the Sun, and if you look at the distant star from two points in the orbit, six months apart in time, then you will see the star in two different, slightly different directions. Of course, this angle here is much smaller in reality, but that is uh, twice the parallax, and the parallax is usually denoted by this Greek letter, pi. And once we have determined the parallax, we can easily get the distance to the star, which is simply one over this parallax. And if this is expressed in arc seconds, we get the distance in parsecs. You need to know the distances to whatever you are observing, whether it is stars or galaxies or quasars. And uh, the parallaxes provide the first step in the distance ladder in the universe. It can give us very precise distances to the nearest stars, and then this information can be used to build 
a ladder of distances further and further out in the universe, even to the most distant objects. Lindegren was a member of the Hipparchos science team for the duration of the mission, from 1976 to 1997. He developed many of the approaches and algorithms related to the mission, the optical and focal plane design, instrument calibration, dynamic smoothing, double star analysis, and the extra galactic reference frame, to name but a few. He also led one of the two ESA consortiums, teams of hundreds of scientists given the task of processing the mountains of data collected during the mission. He acts as a sort of intellectual leader. He is the one who understands important things about how various different parts of the machine work and when there is a technical problem the solution he comes to will generally speaking be the right one he will come to it first and then he will explain it to everyone who needs to understand it in this you know very precise very clear way colleagues say he brings the same rigor to teaching he's careful uh, he's mathematical and he likes to solve mathematical problems, I think, and I think he is intrigued by designing, working out how instruments work, like Hipparchus, like Gaia. He applies the same care and methodology to his teaching as well. I've had the, the luck to interact with him over teaching matters. I believe he is a much liked teacher. Bath, England. Amongst the hedgerows and Georgian architectural bling, Dr. Michael Perryman and his wife, Julia, take a stroll around the 18th century city. Winning the Shaw Prize was a welcome reward after years of effort. We've been together for a long time, so I was there right from the beginning when he became project scientist for Hipparchos at 26, which is amazing to think of now. Um, so yes, I mean, it's, it's something he's very passionate about and therefore I'm interested in it for that point of view, but it is an incredibly interesting subject anyways. Perryman first heard about the Hipparchos mission as a Cambridge postgrad at the European Space Agency. What he heard intrigued him, even though stars weren't really his thing. I was quite ignorant about stars. But from the work that had been done already, I could see how important this mission was. Uh, there the weren't queues of people lining up to do this. I think astrometry was perceived then to be a fairly uh, arcane uh, and not a particularly exciting field. What captivated me was the beauty of the instrumental principles, the mathematical elegance of the whole principles underlying this, the measurement of star positions. At the age of 26, Perryman became the project scientist of the Hipparchos Space Telescope mission. Well, I think Michael started with a very strong mathematical background, uh, which he had and he, he used when he did his uh, PhD in the radio astronomy group in, in Cambridge. Uh, on radio astronomy and cosmology. Somebody there must have recognized that Michael had abilities in mathematical comprehension which would allow him to see the, to see the, the, the mission with an overview and see the, uh, the, the, the elements of that mission which would need to be built in order to uh, get it to operate and, and produce the results. We're measuring how the stars are moving through the galaxy. We're determining how the Hipparchos the team produced data on an unprecedented 120,000 stars. But Perryman and Lindegren knew ESA could do better, and another space telescope mission was launched, building on the successes of Hipparchos. That mission was the Global Astrometric Interferometer for Astrophysics, or GAIA, a larger, more complex space telescope 
wielding newer, more powerful technologies, but still following in the footsteps of Hipparchos. We didn't have to concern ourselves with so much with the principles. Uh, would this work in principle? Um, we could focus instead on the uh, technological complexities of building this massively superior beast. The, the main mirror of Hipparchos is about 30 centimeters in, in diameter. The main mirror of Gaia is one and a half meters in diameter. A, a big difference is that with Hipparchos we could essentially only observe one star at a time, but for Gaia we can observe thousands of stars at the same time because they are simultaneously recorded on these detectors. So that means that Gaia is vastly more efficient than Hipparchos was, just in terms of how it is using the available time. To date, the Gaia mission has mapped roughly two billion stars and counting, a massive collection of data that is still being released. The last release was on June 13th, 2022. The data have already helped NASA navigate its new Horizons spacecraft beyond Pluto. It could help predict future Earth-destroying asteroid impacts. The list of discoveries and uses goes on and on. And it will have implications for many things outside of the field that we would have called classical astrometry. It embeds itself in fundamental physics in, in so many different ways, many of the ways we've not even thought about yet. And we'll, some, of the, some of the papers are coming out of the most amazing things that you never would have thought would have come out. The crystallization of the cores of, of white dwarfs into huge diamonds and, you know, things like this. Gaia keeps collecting observations and sends ever more data back to continue studying and to make more discoveries. We can build up the picture of how galaxies form, how, how they evolve, and what they and why they look like they do now. Gaia is going to measure its own uh, population of planets, and my own predictions there, uh, and and others, is that we should be able to detect perhaps 30,000, 50,000 planets with Gaia. So compare that with the present census of 5,000. What is so interesting about these uh, planetary systems is that they're going to be things that are more like our own solar system than things that have been discovered up until now. That is so exciting because it will signal some of these systems which are going to be perhaps like the Earth. Perhaps they're going to harbor Earth-like planets in, in, in orbit around them. Good evening and welcome to our special on the 2022 Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine. Cystic fibrosis is one of the most common severe single gene disorders affecting more than 80,000 people globally. Michael Welsh and Paul Negulescu share the Shaw Prize for their discoveries of the molecular, biochemical and functional defects underlying cystic fibrosis and the development of medicines that can treat most people affected by this disease. San Diego, California in the United States. Paul Negulescu has worked at this pharmaceutical company for more than 25 years. He leads a research department at this office. <laughs> How you doing? Today, he's catching up with Jennifer Gell and her two children. Both have cystic fibrosis, or CF, a lethogenetic disease. CF came into our lives very violently. Uh, my son was very premature and needed intestinal surgery right away at birth. And it was uh, very unexpected. Um, and so CF for us in the beginning was very challenging. My son had a lot of GI problems, blockages. He had to get a feeding tube put in because he just wasn't able to eat enough. Um, he had multiple sinus infections, lung infections. So my daughter was very different. She still has CF diabetes and liver disease, but nothing as severe as Ashton. 
People get cystic fibrosis from inheriting one mutated gene from each of their parents. CF damages the function of many organs in the body, including the lungs, the pancreas, and gastrointestinal tract. The median age of death is 34 years old, usually from lung disease. People with CF need to take a lot of drugs to get through the day. These are for every time that I eat. I can't go without, um, I mean, a small snack or more would need one of these. So these are all that I take in a day. So I take about 50 pills a day, a CF drug that um, is very much saved my health in a lot of ways. It's been able to stop both lung and sinus infections. Paul led his team to create the breakthrough CF medicines. He was inspired to become a scientist by his professor, a future Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. In my junior year of college, when I took a physiology course from a professor named Roger Chen, the way he could describe how the human body worked, how the lungs and the kidney and the heart all worked together, it just fascinated me and I wanted to learn more. After getting a bachelor's and doctorate degree in physiology from the University of California, Berkeley, Paul joined his professor's biotech company, Aurora Biosciences, in 1996. It later was acquired by Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Another pivotal moment came early in Paul's career when the president of the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Bob Bell, funded the company to discover drugs that could fix the defective gene causing CF. It was almost mission impossible. What I was inexperienced about was the, and naive about, was the low probability of success that we had uh, going into this endeavor. Uh, most drug discovery projects fail. And this was an unprecedented uh, type of project because we were trying to restore the function of a genetically defective protein. His lab used automation, which was rare at the time, to test millions of chemical compounds to find some that had the potential to become medicines. It took six years for his team to discover the first promising chemical compound, VX770. Human lung cells have little hairs that brush back and forth to keep the lung clean. But in lung cells with cystic fibrosis, the hairs don't move. Paul's team added VX770 to the cells. Three days later, the hair started beating. It was a eureka moment for all of us. And I remember even that a couple of the scientists were starting to cry because it was just so beautiful to see the action of the drug uh, in the human cells. Uh, and it gave us confidence that we were on the right track. For people with cystic fibrosis, a mutation or error in the CFTR gene gives bad instructions for making the CFTR protein. The VX770 drug works by binding to the CFTR protein and opens a channel at the cell surface so that salt and water can move across the cell membrane and the protein can function properly. This class of drug is called a potentiator. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved VX770, or Kaleidico, in 2012. It can treat people with the G551D mutation, about 3% of CF patients. But that wasn't enough. Paul and his team forged ahead and created a medicine that would treat people with the f 508 del mutation, which about 90% of CF patients have. They developed another type of drug called a corrector, which binds to the CFTR protein and gets it to the cell surface. The f 508 del mutation required a second corrector, and the potentiator drug opens a channel to help it function properly. It's asking a lot for a small molecule, and that's why people thought it wouldn't work, because they felt that there would be no way that a compound could actually find the right spot on the CFTR protein and that it would find its correct path through the cell and get to the cell surface. No compound had ever done that before. 
The two correctors and potentiator medicine, Tricapta, was approved by the FDA in 2019. Jennifer's children have the F508 Dell mutation and use a new drug. The very first time I, my daughter Lola went to clinic to do her first pulmonary function test after she started taking it, her lung function went up, I think, 13 percent which we'd never seen that kind of an increase before. That was astronomical. They have not had a single infection or sinus problem since they started taking the medication. And just that alone was amazing. The benefits of the newest drug include an 87% reduction in the risk of lung transplant and a 74% reduction in death. With these new treatments, Jennifer started to have big dreams for her children. When my son was a baby, I just wanted him to live. I just wanted him to be able to go to school like everyone else. But now, uh, he's been accepted to UCSD, one of the top schools in the country. And my dreams for him are that he can finish school, have a life of his own, have a family, be able to handle all of his medical issues on his own and live a happy life. It may not be long, but I want it to be happy. And my daughter, because she has been taking these medications for, you know, most of her life, she, the sky's the limit for her. Over 22 years, Paul and his team created four approved medicines that can treat about 90% of people with cystic fibrosis. These colleagues worked with Paul since the beginning. Drug discovery is probably a roller coaster where you have more downhills than uphills. Uh, it is very challenging, it is very hard, and there are many opportunities to give up and walk away. What we have learned over the past 20 years is that any downhills are actually opportunities to learn and to do better. And that's pretty much what we've learned as a team working with Paul. I learned from Paul over the last 20 years is, you know, our, our purpose is to help people with cystic fibrosis and other, you know, unmet medical diseases. And, and we do this by driving the science forward. Um, and, and setting, you know, even higher bars to continue to improve the medicines. And when Paul is not at the office, science is still a big part of his life. He met his wife, Deborah while doing postdoctoral work at the University of California in Irvine, where she was getting a PhD in molecular biology. I thought she was very pretty and very smart. We started talking about science though, and uh, that was um, how we connected. Uh, she's actually a very good scientist, and she does uh, very difficult molecular biology, and the types of experiments that she was doing, I could not do. And so I was very uh, impressed with the work she was doing, and I wanted to get to know her better. They got married and had three children, and science was a regular topic of conversation at home. Yeah, we talked about politics, science, and then we'd always do quizzes. Like, what's the mitochondria do? Like, is, like and we talk about cell structure and just, uh, just simple things. We wanted them to be curious, and we just felt like by bringing up conversations like that, whether or not it was history or science, at least it made them curious about what's going on. I'm fine, do a quiz, but... Their youngest child, Natalie, says that science influenced Paul's parenting. Whenever I do go out and do something, he, um, he always asks data points. When, where, who, why, how? And that's from being a scientist. You know, he always likes the data. He always likes just facts. But, you know, of course, with a little bit of sensitivity. <laughs> Paul's family is very proud that he's receiving the Shaw Prize in Life Science and Medicine, which he shares with Michael Welsh. I've known Michael for 25 years, and I have the highest respect for him as a scientist and a physician. Uh, Michael made so many seminal uh, discoveries about 
how the disease worked. And he was so instrumental in shaping our understanding of the approaches that might be beneficial in res restoring the function of CFTR. So his, the basic research that he did uh, established a foundation for us to do our work. We'll meet co-winner Michael Welsh after the break. Iowa City, Iowa, United States. A native of the Hawkeye State, Michael Welsh was inspired to a career in service. I was influenced by President John Kennedy. I remember him creating the Peace Corps. I remember him inspiring people to do things beyond themselves. And I think that perhaps that was an important motivation. So I applied to medical school. He received his medical degree here at the University of Iowa in 1974 and trained in San Francisco and Houston. He returned to work at the university as a physician scientist in 1981. And as a physician, you always want to do something. When a parent brings in a child, and ask you to help that child, it's like a hot brand that just burns you, and you want to help. And as a physician scientist, maybe we, through our research, could impact the lives of these people. He is a specialist in lung disease and treated people with cystic fibrosis, a lethal genetic disease in the clinic. The thing that people would primarily die from in CF is from lung disease. They get infections in the lung, but the infections don't go away. And what this meant is that they're not going to have normal activities. They're not going to be running around the, with the other kids outside, playing tag, that kind of thing. And they're going to have a short life. When I started this, the average life expectancy was probably somewhere in the probably somewhere in the early teens. About 80,000 people globally suffer from cystic fibrosis. CF affects multiple organs. Normally, lung airways and passages in other organs are coated inside with a thin layer of fluid and mucus. The mucus catches dust and germs from the air that's breathed in. Then hairs in the airways push the mucus, dust, and germs out of the lungs. In CF, the mucus is so thick and sticky that germs like bacteria get trapped. The airways are blocked and causes infections. We didn't understand the disease well enough to make medicines that could help these people. We could treat them with antibiotics, but that's treating the symptoms. It's not treating the fundamental problem. And that's where our work came in. Our research helped people understand what the problem is, what goes wrong, why, why don't they clear these infections. Then you can see a way forward to try and fix it. In 1989, the CFTR gene that causes cystic fibrosis was discovered. The CFTR gene gives instructions to create a CFTR protein. And Michael and his team discovered that the CFTR protein was a channel which regulated the movement of salt and water in and out of cells. And in people with CF, the channel doesn't function properly, and thick mucus builds up in many organs. That was important because all of a sudden one could understand, now I understand why someone might have an abnormality in their airways. It began to tie all this together and it tied it back to the genetics. He and his team identified four types of cystic fibrosis gene mutations. Once you know that there are different ways that a protein malfunction, then anybody who's looking for, for a therapy would know that you have to identify medicines that will target the different mutations in a different way. And Michael's lab showed it was possible to fix f 508 del the most common mutation which 90% of CF patients had. When the temperature of the cell was lowered to 25 degrees Celsius, 
the CFTR protein could function. That was incredibly exciting because it said, here's the problem and it may be possible to fix it. And that then allowed things to go forward. It showed a roadmap for how we get the development of a new drug. It just lit a match, lit a match to the field. The Shaw Prize Life Science and Medicine co-winner, Paul Negulescu, used the research from Michael's lab to develop medicines that can treat about 90% of cystic fibrosis patients. And the new drugs have been saving lives at the University of Iowa hospitals. If a person has cystic fibrosis and their lungs completely fail, the really the only option is to, was to get a lung transplant. The number of transplants that we're doing has gone down 75% for people with CF. So what that says is you take the very sickest people and now they're stopped and they actually get some better and they don't have a transplant. That's incredible. Joseph Zabner came to Iowa to work in Michael's lab more than 30 years ago. Joseph was part of the team that made landmark CF discoveries and he admires Michael as a scientist and as a person. I've tried for many years to try to get, make it to the laboratory before he comes or leave after he leaves. And you know, finally I figured out I couldn't do it. <laughs> he, he works really, really hard. The second thing, he, as a scientist, he, he, he knew what the question that needed to be asked. The, the, the third thing is, is humble, is, you know, uh, I've never heard him brag about how smart he is or how, how right or how much he has. These are relative newcomers to Michael's lab. He's taught them to be better scientists. He is really, really great example, a good example for to be a nice scientist. This field is really competitive, but Mike did a different way. So he showed me that sharing and caring is the most important thing. So you share your material with them, and they later they might share the experience and the methods with you also. Something that played a big role in Mike's success was working with other people. And he knew how to recruit the right people and then also have those people contribute towards the discoveries. Michael continues to push scientific boundaries. So these drugs are incredibly well for 85%, maybe 90% of people with CF. Of course, that means there's 15% of people or so that we don't have a drug for. There's multiple different approaches that we and our colleagues are taking. Gene therapy, gene editing, try and fix the DNA in, in the person. Besides cystic fibrosis, Michael is collaborating with his former postdoctoral fellow, Lei Liu, who is based in Beijing, to develop treatments for people suffering from Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. We have zero treatments that stop the progressive cell death, whether that's Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, uh, ALS, the long list, zero treatments. So as I look at this, I think the biggest challenge, the biggest biomedical challenge of our time is neurodegenerative diseases. When Michael is not working in the lab, he enjoys walks on the prairie with his wife, Anne. She has a background in medical research, <laughs> and she is the first person he turns to when he has a new idea or makes a scientific breakthrough. For Mike, because he loves what he does so much, it's not work. He absolutely thrives on it. So I foresee him going off into the sunset <laughs> pursuing medical research and loving it the whole time. And isn't that, a, isn't that a wonderful gift for, for anyone to do what they love and to use their gifts to help other people? And that's what he wants to do, and I support him 100%. His advice for budding scientists just starting out on their careers? Work on important problems. 
If you work on a trivial problem, you're going to probably get trivial answers. If you work on an important problem, you might get trivial answers, but you might get important ones. So go after the most important question in your area that you have some hope that you might be able to break through. Jean Robillard used to be Michael's dean at the university. He thinks Michael's scientific research is exceptional, which is why John nominated Michael for the Shaw Prize. The Shaw Prize represents really the best people, the best science, and what is really what science is going for the future. And we thought that what Mike has done in his career and what he has achieved is really unique. As a scientist, he is probably at the highest level you can have. Michael Welsh and Paul Negulescu share the Shaw Prize in life science and medicine for unraveling the molecular and biochemical mysteries of cystic fibrosis and developing medicines that alleviate human suffering and save lives. This is a relatively short period of time from discovery and understanding to development of a drug that has such a huge impact on people who had limited options before its discovery. And then to see this in the clinic, to go and see these people, I still am amazed. I feel so incredibly fortunate to see this arc in my time. It's an incredible example for understanding and the developing a new treatment for a genetic disease, a genetic disease that was lethal and doesn't have to be lethal anymore. Welcome back to our special on the 2022 Shaw Prize. The co-winners of the Mathematical Sciences Award are Ehud Rushovsky and Noga Alon, two remarkable Israeli prize winners for their contribution to discrete mathematics, model theory, algebraic geometry, and computer science. Professor Noga Alon starts every day with some exercises he learned in the Israeli army. He says he doesn't get many ideas about mathematics during his workouts, but the daily routine brings a certain clarity of thought. The exercise, I think, uh, help you uh, to stay alert and to stay awake, and, uh, and maybe it, uh, being not being sleepy helps you to focus or to concentrate uh, more. The Israeli-born mathematician earned his PhD in 1983 and spent most of his career at Tel Aviv University before joining Princeton in 2018. From early on, he liked the fact that something proven in math will last forever. It's not like a discussion on, a, on some, a, say, political topic where everybody can have a, uh, his or her own opinion, uh, but, uh, but really uh, the, the truth of something uh, stays forever. And, uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, one thing that, uh, that I liked. Uh, his parents encouraged him and his brother to do anything they wanted, but insisted they had to be serious about it. It was one of his high school teachers that gave him the itch to study math. In the end of uh, high school uh, in Israel, uh, I had uh, a very special uh, uh, teacher. Uh, he was uh, a new immigrant that came from uh, Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he was uh, teaching us uh, some more advanced material than, uh, than in school, uh, and, uh, uh, and I followed it uh, enthusiastically. Michael Kravelovich has known Alon for 30 years as a PhD student, colleague, and collaborator. He says Alon mastered numerous fields in combinatorics and computer science. Unlike many people in theoretical mathematics, Noga has done also, has been doing actually, quite amazing things which have uh, applied and pr practical value and some significant contributions like uh, streaming algorithms, analysis of streaming, or maybe some uh, algorithmic contribution or analysis of algorithms, they are also of fairly practical value. And, uh, 
Another colleague remembers how Alon reduced a 70-page proof down to just two pages. Which reminds me the story, I think it's uh, about, I think it's attributed to uh, Mark Twain, that he was asked to, to give a talk. And uh, they asked him, how long do you need to give the talk? So he uh, said that if I know the topic very well, so I can, should give a talk of, for one hour. If I'm an expert, then 20 minutes will be enough. And if I don't know anything about it, then I can speak as long as you want. So uh, Noga, in that sense, can give, expand everything in 20 minutes. He sees connections between subjects that nobody else sees. He, he understands algebra, he understands analysis, he understands the computer science, all these ideas, all these concepts that uh, are so clear to him and less clear to others. Alon's family sees the Shaw Prize as the logical progression of a long career. He and his wife, Nurit, met in kindergarten. I'm very proud that he received the Shaw Prize and he deserves this. And I know he deserved it because I've been with him along the way for many, many years. And I've seen that he's very devoted to his career, uh, like a uh, hundred percent. And uh, I think it's really nice to be recognized as a very good and the best one in your field. Daughter Nili studied math too. He would always ask me since I was a child like these riddles, like if you have uh, 24 oranges, how do you uh, divide them to six kids and stuff like that. <laughs> and uh, I actually never knew he was such a star. So only when I went to study math myself, when I was a student, I was walking in the university and I would hear people say, um, did you already say hi to Noga Alon? Or uh, people came to me and say, you're so lucky you're his daughter. Like then I realized he's actually a rock star. The family reckons the math talent will continue to pop up as the years go by, but that isn't what holds them together. I think it's all about love. And uh, it's about love that started like uh, 45 years ago. Uh, or maybe 50 years ago, and it's still going on strong. So, math is very important, but love is the most important thing that is uh, all around us all the time. Isaac Newton went to Cambridge, but Oxford has its own list of mathematical legends. Haley, Powell, Penrose. For Professor Yehud Rosofsky, mathematics is a walk in the park, one where sometimes he gets some good ideas. Even if I'm running or, or walking or not even, especially when I'm doing that, I'm kind of struggling with it and trying to get it because it's fun, because the idea is there. And in fact, it's not yet there, but I see that there must be something. I see a connection and I cannot let it go. Rashovsky worked for many years at MIT and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem before moving to Oxford. His interest in math started early in his school years. On the one hand, in grade school, being very afraid of the multiplication table, I felt that I missed exactly the class where they taught seven times eight or something, and I was always very nervous about having to do that. But on the other hand, when we learned, we actually learned one proof, which was the proof of commutativity of multiplication. They drew a kind of rectangle and they counted the corners, I guess. And I was absolutely fascinated by that and I still remember it. He also remembers his father left a book about mathematics out for him to read. Still, he took a circuitous path to the science. I wanted to be a science fiction writer. So I thought, well, first I would learn some mathematics then I would learn physics, and then I would be qualified to be a science fiction writer, which is what I want to be. I really thought of mathematics as a preparation for something else. I think it would probably be, I thought, well, I'm more interested in philosophy, maybe philosophy of language at that time, uh, but it would be a good idea to know some mathematics. However, uh, I was captivated by the mathematics. Colleagues say Rashofsky's signature work in model theory, a relatively young branch of mathematical logic, brought the obscure field to the attention of the science as a whole, using unique tools. 
Before his work, most other mathematicians didn't know anything about model theory. In fact, practitioners of the branches of model theory, the theoretical and the applied, didn't know or understand what the other branches were doing, until Rashofsky. I think he was the sort of the father, if you want, of unifying our subject so that people realized that it was in different directions, okay? That the pure part and the applied part were really aspects of one subject and should unify, and then people started to talk to each other. And that was very important for our subject. So this means he actually changed our subject, changed the way other mathematicians looked at our subject. In these applications of model theory to, to a number of other areas, he's really forged new connections uh, notably with algebraic geometry and additive combinatorics, but also other areas. And the, the, the flow of ideas somehow backwards and forwards really boosts the vitality of mathematics overall. Our two Israeli laureates demonstrate the depth of talent in the country's mathematics community, a fact that has long roots in the country's short history. It was a huge uh... Russian immigration uh, that was a, so there was a big wave in the 70s, but an even bigger wave in the beginning of the 90s. And traditionally, Russia was very uh, strong in, uh, in mathematics and maybe specifically uh, Jewish people in Russia. Uh, a lot of them were doing mathematics. Uh, possibly partly because they uh, couldn't go into more practical sciences. In the Hebrew University, I, there was a fantastic atmosphere. There was a very friendly atmosphere. Uh, people were very open, people were very interested in each other's work. And it's very common to have people go to many, many seminars in many different uh, subjects. 